back to my time, you know, we were Westminster in the Brown government, obviously, uh, 2010 and the change that came in and the ill thought through austerity program that was inflicted on, uh, on the country. I think what grew through that decade was a growing feeling that far too many people and a, a, a heavy concentration of those people in the north of England living life without basics. Well, let me put it a different way, living life without security over the basics. So they may be getting some of the things, but they couldn't live with the certainty of knowledge that every week the basics would be absolutely there and in place for them. And I'm thinking about, obviously, uh, enough food to feed themselves and their, and their kids, um, enough money to cover the rent without having to compromise on food or uh, heating or utilities, but also then enough money just to make sure that the kids aren't missing out on, on, on things. You know, I think that, that feeling was growing all the way through that, that decade and obviously we saw the rise, of, <laughs> the rise of food banks, which it's a sad reflection, is it not? But that is just part of infrastructure now in, in Britain. You now, what, what, what's happening here? Uh, and we're, we're beginning to talk about data banks, you know, sort of donated connectivity for people to try and keep them on, online. You know, clothes banks, there's all kinds of, that infrastructure is building, not, not, not diminishing, it's, it's becoming sadly uh, a reflection of where where we are but for me i guess the pandemic was the moment when the tide went out in march 2020 and we really saw the state of the nation what kind of country uh, that we were it, it was plain to see that there were large numbers of people in greater manchester particularly in certain communities where if they were ill they couldn't go home from work because they weren't employed in a way that would allow them to do that. And that is a terrible state of affairs, certainly in the pandemic, but it's a bad state of affairs outside of the pandemic. Because those people now will be the people who are worrying themselves to sleep every night about whether or not they can make it work, whether they can make it happen. <clears throat> They're the kind of people who will make massive sacrifices for their kids, but will make huge compromises on what, what they've got. I think this year, as we've kind of come through this period we've been living through, I think people's lives are changing dramatically across West Manchester right now with all of the uh, talk about energy bills and you know, what's the news today that we're going to be worse than, than what we were, the cap is going to be higher than what people uh, thought it was going to be. I'm hearing that the price hike in terms of food has not really fully come through yet. That's coming in November, December. It's terrifying, isn't it? This is really worrying. And those people, I think, are, as I say, worrying themselves to sleep. I am told from one of the food banks in Salford that they've stopped giving out frozen food because people have turned off their freezers. So anything that requires energy, um, they're just turning it off. They're changing, people are changing their lives now. Um, and that's, that's the reality. And I suppose, you know, well, the pandemic really kind of threw that into sharp relief as you could see it. You could ask, you could see that people living those lives and then you could see the effects of that way people were forced to live in terms of the cases. It was just plain. And let's be honest, the places where the case rate was highest of the same places that have always had the most entrenched poverty. If you go back much decades, centuries, I would probably, would probably argue. And the North-South divide was completely clear in, in the data. So... That is the issue, isn't it? We've got to a point where millions of our fellow citizens are living without security over their work and their income, over their home, um, and therefore over their, um, you know, their, their lives. And it, it explains why you know, we are now very much in the grip of a second pandemic, which is a mental health uh, pandemic. And that one has been growing for a long time as well. Uh, but I think it's now absolutely uh, the, the issue of the day in which we're, 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 uh, we're living. So that then brings you to the point, well, what do we do about uh, this? I, I think it requires a challenge to what people might call the sort of neoliberal consensus or kind of the uh, 
at times the sort of narrative that's set by the media that political parties buy into far too much and that is this kind of uh, <clears throat> thing about strivers and what was it skivers and this kind of narrative you know that this kind of thing that you know the, the political debate is always going to be tough on them and tough on this and tough on that and rules about this or you know I, I think we've what we've seen in this country is you know from the 70s when men, I'm not saying everybody here but some of us were growing up let's let me put it that way in, in the 70s where there was secure work and secure housing for people and plentiful ca council housing we've kind of seen that stripped away certainly from a housing point of view and then the work became more insecure as we went through the 90s and that and, and that period and on top of that then you've got this sort of narrative about you know oh they undeserving and this that and the other you know a narrative about people on lower incomes that compounds the the, the, the damage uh, and i think at some point you've got to break out of that and the big thing that i wanted to get over uh, today is we've got to try and make the case about setting people up to succeed in this country by putting firm foundations beneath them rather than setting them up to fail as we do i think we do set up people to fail we create the rules and issues and problems and challenges that basically mean that that some people won't be able to make it make it all work and i want to come back to what i said about homelessness because i think that journey i we're still on in fact because we're not in any way solved that we've come a long way in terms of our understanding of what can be done to move things forward from a homelessness point of view i i i, I do kind of point to the uh housing first um project that we've set up here has been really quite uh changing for me in terms of my perspective on all of these things i went to finland who are the one of the countries that have been most associated with housing first uh to see how their project had been set up before i you know, we were setting ours up here and for those who don't know you know housing first is a scheme that's about giving people security of housing and very personalized support to help to make a journey away from the street and to recover. And what I kind of found in Finland surprised me and the, the ministers I met said, well, Housing First isn't just a project, it's a philosophy. It's a national philosophy that says all government departments here in Finland buy into the notion that without housing, good housing, people can't have anything. They can't have good health, can't have good education. You can't have a good life without good housing. It's just, it is basic. It's, not, it's almost like, why do we need to travel to Finland to be told that? But, um, but that's not how it's been here, is it? It's not how it's been. We've not given people security over the basics. We've allowed that security to be, to be stripped away. And it, when then I kind of took that back here and we started to build the Housing First project here, and bear in mind, we're talking about people who've been through traumatic experiences in their life before sleeping rough on the street, but compounded by the experience of sleeping rough, which causes catastrophic damage to people's physical health, but also their mental health as well. We set up our scheme and we started to um, kind of implement it with a real kind of high fidelity to the principles of housing first, no compromise on that. And the results as they came through really started to sort of tell a story that I think people need to focus on, i.e. if you give people space, time and support to recover, they will. If you set people up to succeed, they will. And actually, if you do all of those things, you probably save money by not constantly paying for crisis and failure as, as the current system makes people do. The kind of pernicious combination of benefit rules and the housing rules, I think, often create the things that trip people up and make, and make them fall, particularly if people have kind of trauma in an earlier life and have got complex needs as a result of, of that. But that's the way things work for most people here. And Housing First said to me, well, actually, if you put firm foundations beneath people, the vast majority of people will use those to build a better life. And that is what Housing First in Greater Manchester is showing us. Over 80% of people have sustained their tenancies, which is way beyond, I think, what people thought would happen at the start. And it's true more broadly in terms of what we're doing on homelessness, where we, we've moved through our bed every night scheme to a position where we're trying not to offer people a single room now and give people quality and privacy and dignity back then the recovery that's the condition for recovery you leave people in a revolving door in here and out there then it doesn't unsurprising it doesn't happen 
So I kind of take that experience <coughs> and then I want to then apply it more, uh, more, more broadly. It, let's see if we can then, security over housing can then move to security over income. And I think those two things would then give uh, the foundation for people uh, to, to have good lives. And I also think it would, it would reduce the, um, the cost of, of failure, which often the British state thinks it's fine to sort of pay for failure on a, on a colossal scale. But why don't we start paying for success on a, on a colossal scale? Um, and that's the change I think we need to make. So I, I am quite happy to say today that I would put ourselves out there to be a UBI trial. I, I applaud Mark Drakeford and what the uh, Welsh Assembly Government are doing, uh, looking at a, a universal basic income scheme for care leavers, and that is a, a move that should be applauded. But let's see if we can if we can construct a scheme um, that, that could be pitched as a pilot um, to to a government. Because we are we will be ready and willing to do it here. I think hearing what I've heard from the well, two political from the leadership contenders, what is it, Thatcherite? Low tax, small state. I think it's probably unlikely that they're going to be knocking on my door, offering me a UBI pilot anytime soon. But I would want my own party to do it and pilot pilot it here, um, in Wales as well, um, in a, with an incoming uh, Labour or you know, central uh, government. Because um, I think the, I think the results would surprise us all, and I think it would tilt us more towards a Finnish or a Scandinavian philosophy. Where we do say housing first, housing is a human right in UK law, good, safe, affordable housing for everybody. And then on top of that, an income that is enough to cover the basics for everybody so they can live and feed their children without worrying. And then the societal benefit that flows from that, in my view, will more than pay, uh, pay uh, for, for it. And I think we're ready to do it. I think we've hit a point here where what we've been doing isn't just working, it's catastrophically not working when you look at the experience of poorer communities during the pandemic. We had an independent inequalities commission which came back with some really clear evidence for us in terms of what has been done to the point of the pandemic has put millions of, puts millions of people at risk. But those people are still at risk outside of, outside of the pandemic. So we're ready for change. If you're ready for change, let's make this case together and um, see if we can build the argument for Greater Manchester as England's first UBI pilot. Thank you for me. Um, right, let's take a couple of questions. Um, I'm pretty sure I've got the questions, but I can't see how many. Okay. All right, I'm going to go um, uh, to the front first. And I'll hand you the mic if that's right. Um, thanks very much. I was really, really interested in um, inspiring. So I'm Dave Beck, I'm a lecturer at Salford University in Salford Policy, yeah. and I'm also a co-chair of UBI Lab, Greater Manchester. Um, you mentioned the idea of stability, and we know that stability helps people build their lives. But the current political system that we've got I mean, is really bound up with the neoliberalism, as we mentioned. Mm. And we know that neoliberalism is bound up with the idea of individualism, being able to stand on your own two feet. It comes with the idea of meritocracy as well. So, how do we move towards the idea of bringing in universal basic income when both of our leading political parties are more towards the neoliberal end than you know, more the social end? Well, it's a very good question, and I'm not saying I've got an easy answer, but with that argument that you say about people standing on their own two feet. How can you with the foundations of you can't stand on your own yeah, feet yeah, no. if what's underneath you is crumbling? And that's the argument, isn't it? You know, if people haven't got the basics, which is what I understand by universal basic income, then they can't stand on their, their own two feet. They're at risk of falling over. And that is the problem. And I think we're going to struggle uh, in its current mindset this way anyone on the right, centre right, to, but I, I would, I, I think in the same way that Labour reinvented Britain and its safety net and its support systems after the Second World War, yeah. that is what we have to do now because 
the old, as I said, the old way of thinking and that new liberalism has not protected people. It's left people at risk. And I think this is about making a very big argument, actually, about the times that we live in, the pernicious effects of stripping security away from people. And they, you know, they are very pernicious. And it does create that mental health pandemic that I spoke about. I think it's it's um, it's an argument for a very big change, but it's also, I would say, an argument for not running everything through that prism of Westminster, you know, where there's just a whoever's in government, my experience of it down there, there's a hundred or so people making the decisions. Most backbench MPs are pretty disempowered in that system by the effects of the parliamentary whip. You've got a hundred people, largely in and around 10 Downing Street and the Treasury is who are, let's say, hackable by the media because they just, you know what I mean? They're just getting all of that. There was a gender that's thrown at them and that's why you get this sort of... So I do, th I, I've, I've spoken about this, this before and I, I do think for anybody who cares about universal basic income, I, I would suggest to you, you've got to also start making the argument for the complete rewiring of Britain's political system because it won't have the consensus to sustain it if you don't. It, it will be my argument. And that means for me, making power flow differently throughout these islands in that I think that first past the post, as I've just said, disempowers the people who say <laughs> I'm, 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 I'm speaking with the zeal of the convert here, because I didn't always, I'm just being honest, uh, but it does, it does. Um, so I'm, I am saying, Proportional representation would create more power in the hands of people as voters. I am saying it is abomination to have a second chamber unelected drawn from largely within the M25. I mean, who can justify that? I, I just what is the justification for that? There isn't one in my view. So a, a Senate of the nations and regions. But then maximum devolution out of that. That system should only do what it has to do around tanks and military and all of those kind of issues then let power out and that's what that's why mark drayford is interested i think in this in this context that is what happens when you let power out of that door he's not looking over his shoulder at the daily mail when he does his you know he doesn't care about that he, he's doing what he thinks to be right for young people who've been in an experience the care system in wales that is what happens i think devolution does change things and you probably will say it's, it's changed it has changed the way i, I see things when you're stuck in that western world i'm afraid it does make you point in a certain way and you hear the narratives that go around there coming out of it is the healthiest thing that anyone can do to be honest and i think you've got to rewire the country to be honest with you to get i do think it requires my party to have a bold vision of what post-pandemic britain can look like but i also think if you're going to sustain those things, I think it does require the rewiring that I'm speaking about. I think we can just take one more question, probably. Um, I come, I'm going to until 22, but I'm just going to take Okay, well, let's try and fit some in. So um, I'll be quick on this. Yeah, if you can keep the question short, if you have a short, we can fit them all in. Thank you. Um, would you like to see you with your question? Hi. Hi, Pastor Johnson. Uh, I probably could. Um, I'm not going to say that they're all in. It would be. I can't speak to the tech for ten leaders, uh, but I do think people's understanding of health inequality has moved on a lot in the last three years, and it's clear to anyone who spends any time just looking at this, it is a question of work. It's a question of housing, and it's a question of. Um, also early years and investment in the early years. I think 
if you were to properly change the way we do things in those areas, you create the conditions to create health in homes and in workplaces and in schools and in, in communities. And that has to be done. You only will do that with the, you know, the, the security over living, over the basics, as I keep saying, security over the basics will create health and will close health inequalities. It really is as, as simple as that. And uh, I think we would say, well, where do we look for the evidence? This week? It is there, isn't it? I mean, it's, you know, a big colleagues in the room might be familiar with the book, The Spirit Level, you know, that uh, it's very clear that more equality, more equal societies are better for everybody. And, you know, that is the art. We, the evidence is absolutely plain. You know, uh, Kate uh, Pickett obviously chaired our Independent Inequalities Commission. And she was chosen for, for that reason, because that is an argument that we need to, to make um, to everybody to everybody here. I think we know what will close health inequalities. Um, it's just, can we get, you know, a consensus to, to be able to do it? We've got a good employment charter here, which we are linking to all public procurement. We're beginning to make that bottom up sort of move. But the real change, I, I think it's hard to see how it can come without Whitehall at some point by, buying into this. So we've got to make, and I think it is important we make that, that argument cross, cross party. This will not be won by looking at our own tribal sort of loyalties. I honestly, and I, I wrote that in the Observer recently, this, the rewiring of the country is to sustain a new social consensus about, about these things. Okay, and we have a question right at the far. Okay. Yeah, thanks, Andy. What, what can we do uh, in the Labour Party as members to get all the folks in the network to commit to the EBI files locally? It's a good question, and yeah, I've asked myself a little bit. I think you've answered it in some ways. That a trial, you know, that is probably the way to do it. And I, I would let me be fair. I remember the pressures on people down there, so it's not all me being easy now because I'm out there and I can just say what I like to them. Uh, which when I do say what I like, um, I, I think it is about because I don't think anyone could go to UBI as a national. But I think that would be a tough thing to do for any government. Let's be honest. So I think it is about a trial, isn't it? You know, what Mark's doing in Wales, but build that up a bit and then we might be able to, to, to build something up from housing first, you know, and kind of build it up rather than sort of going too far too fast and it all, and, they, and the people who all want to criticise it, just all then, you know, rowing in on it. I think you've got to start with that principle, set people up to succeed. Let's set people up to succeed rather than fail. And I think sell the principle to the Labour Party, which I hope, but well, they will agree with that. And then... You know, build it by a trials pilots. So I think it's probably the best way to go. Thank you very much. I'm just going to take one last question. And um, you have to hand up. You, did you still want to ask your question? Definitely. But can I also just say something more though? The UBI network, I think needs to become a youth network. Honestly. Because many of us are not you know, it's that generation I think that's most at risk for lack of I've got one of your students, I think, at the back of the room, um, Megan and Anita, who I work shadowing GMCA today, who are in the office, and I dragged you both here, didn't I? Because I, I both obviously amazing um, kind of examples of the sort of next generation, but I want, I want them to kind of hear what, what's being talked about here, because I think the younger generation can really see clearly 
that the world is not set up for them necessarily to succeed. Where, you know, if I go, if I compare myself in the 80s and 90s when I was trying to come and graduate and came back here to Manchester, I mean, yeah, I had a bit of that, but we had more security then over housing and other things. It wasn't, but it's, it's changed, life has changed. It's, I think this current generation, you know, university fees and goodness knows what, can see that they are not, there's no guarantees, none at all. They are at risk, aren't they? But they can't see, they, you know, how do I get from where I am to the job I want, from the home I have, I don't think they can see that in the same way that we could see that, even though things could have been tough, and, well, they were tough, weren't they, in, in the 80s and, and whatever, 90s. I think, I would really recommend this becoming a youth movement as well. I, I don't know how it's easier said than done, of course, but I, I think that's where the answer lies. I always say to anybody who shadows me that my generation of politicians has messed it all up. And it's, I think the, that generation, anyone under 25, you know, I, my kids are kind of at that age now, they look at the world through different eyes. I think they can see the climate challenge very differently to anyone over 25. They, they see diversity as you know, the great strength of, of, of our places. And, um, and I think they also know that the world is not set up for them, for them in the way that they want it to be set up. And I think they're going to they're gonna be the ones that do the rewiring. Honestly, I do. And I think they're the ones that want a good life for all. You know, I think that there is a belief in equality. I think, I think there's a stronger belief in equality and diversity amongst under 25s than I see it in people. I'm worried maybe that's a controversial <laughs> note, but I do. And I have a huge hope for the generation that's coming. And I think they are the, going to be the ones that are going to have to make this century work better for people. Because it really doesn't. You know, we're, we're, what are we now? We're fifth of the way in, and it's really not working isn't it really not working and i think britain's on the, the brink of a really dangerous moment here if we go low tax thatcher right small state from here honestly what what does that mean for people that i've been, we've been talking about scary is what it means terrifying and i just think you have to fight back against this at some point you know you have to fight back and we've got to mobilize young people to to, to really call for something different they put pressure on the labor party absolutely quite rightly all of them though everyone down there needs to be confronted with the reality of life now in the way that it's just you know who is set up to succeed in this country now you're talking of a, a smaller and smaller group of people at the middle or top of organizations aren't you and and that is the reality that is getting worse and worse all the time so that's where we are. That's a cheery thought. My last, uh, <laughs> my last thought for you all today. Good luck. But do you agree? Should we build this as a youth treatment as well? Because they, it's the younger generation that's got the most to benefit from the universal basic income, from a housing first philosophy. You know, why not? Thank you very much. I'll be totally <laughs> um, So we've had it there. Uh, we've had the the front of the queue asking for the pilot. Young people in the future who just need to make sure they know about universal basic income. Um, thank you very much. I, I don't think we have time for any more questions for Andy. Um, am I right? Yeah, I'm right. Super. Thank you so much. No